Okay, it's time to start uh, the live video for April. Uh, we'll wait a few more minutes and see if people are still joining. So I'll start properly in a few minutes. This is a test. If you can hear me, just please let me know. Just sound check, please. Just type on the little thing if you can hear me, Fox. Thank you. Okay, let's start now. Welcome to the live video for April. I always say that I want to do these live videos at least once a month, but I, it turns out that it's uh, <laughs> once every quarter. So remember, folks, it's up to you to push me to do these live videos. I really enjoy doing them, but time really flies by. So it has been three months since the last time we did one. Uh, for this one, I'm going to go over our about uh, over certain subjects, in particular the subjects that were requested in the main room. But let's do it right here. So let's start with the NDLA right away. Now that's, that's the first discussion that we are going to have. So of course we are going to focus on the classic uh, NDLA, the, the one that we have been using for, for some time. And as you can see, the performance has been fantastic. Now we cannot ask for more about this net this net has been performing really well, which is kind of ironic because uh, one of the reasons we decided to retrain it was because to improve uh, the precision and to improve uh, the number of signals. And suddenly in the last month, in the last two months or three months, the, the performance has uh, increased a lot. So right now it's unbeatable at 100% precision. So out of five signals, the five signals has been correct have been correct, so uh, uh, there is no way to beat that, there is no way to improve on, on perfect precision. But the thing is, uh, going forward, you look at the precision for the last nine months, it has been only 56%. So, so that's where I was trying to focus on trying to improve that particular precision. So uh, that's why I decided in the NDLA 2.0, because that's a, that is a, a good way to uh, to, to improve the numbers in particular for longer term. So well, a couple of things here with the NDLA. It's obvious that we are right now at 100%. So it's obvious that we are going to revert to the, to the long term average. So for those of you that are really uh, looking at these numbers, please don't get a second mortgage the next time we get a positive signal here, because even though it has been 100%, just you know, the central limit theorem tells us that it will go down to around 56, 57 eventually. So just keep the discipline and keep the system in place. That's how it should be done because uh, very recent performance uh, is not in line with the historical performance. It has been too much, too high, I guess, for, for the recent time. So I am introducing NDLA 2.0, NDLA 2.0. What is the NDLA 2.0? It is a variation on the NDLA, and I know that Gene asked a question about it specifically, uh, how it's different. So without giving away the secret sauce, the structure of the NDLA in general is a deep learning net, neural net. And it's deep learning because it has three hidden layers between the inputs and the outputs. So there I have three layers. Uh, I don't have any convolution in the layers at all in the original NDLA. 
and and it's a binary classifier so i am maximizing for that so for those of you that know about neural nets and are trying to replicate the NDLA, i'm just dropping a little hint for you to do your own thing um, so so yes i am maximizing my 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 error function is not quite the same error function i use a different error function and also as a binary classifier, uh, my activation function is slightly different too. I will not go into details of what kind of activation function I use. But, um, but yes, so that's what I use in the NDLA Classic. So NDLA 2.0 is, uh, is a deeper net. It's a net that has more depth. It has more than three layers. It has actually five hidden layers. And also, uh, it uses historical inputs. The current NDLA uses 11 inputs per day. And of course, there is some history in them. No? There is a history, for instance, on the realized variance. There is some history on ambiguity there. But NDLA 2.0 is actually taking a screenshot of the last five sessions. So what are the inputs to the NDLA 2.0 are actually 55 inputs. What I'm doing is I am having a uh, day by day I am inputting the five previous values of all of these inputs to the NDLA 2.0. Uh, it's in, in some way it's like providing a picture with past. Now it's kind of a like movie so if, if you imagine NDLA classic is just a picture NDLA 2.0 is looking at the movie at the movement of uh, what is uh, what the thing is doing. So so that's why NDLA 2.0 is. If we look at the numbers, you, they look terrible. I mean, look, full precision is 55% versus 100%. And it, you will say, man, that, that looks bad, but it, it doesn't look that bad. Notice the thing I like about NDLA 2.0 is that it generates way more signals than NDLA Classic. I like that because it keeps us uh, playing upside. And, but is having a low precision. So for instance, in the last month, it has generated nine signals and only 55.56 of them have been correct. In other words, five have been correct. <laughs> so, uh, and that sounds bad, but it's not that bad because among those nine signals are the three positive signals we already had this week. So this week we have three positive signals, one, two, two here and three here and all of them failed no all of the signals failed but the, the truth is they, they didn't fail that much actually we managed to make money of the first two and for those of you that were disciplined not like me unlike me you might have made lots of money yesterday on this one too so yes the algorithm from the, the statistical definition is not having as good performance as the classic, but I am very satisfied with the performance so far. Imagine if these three signals will have been successful, the, uh, the precision will have been substantially higher. We'll have eight out of nine. So I am not displeased yet with NDLA 2.0, and I think I will use both of the algos simultaneously. I will use NDLA as a more conservative uh, type of algorithm that generates signals once in a blue moon, and NDLA 2.0 as a more experimental risky algorithm, and I am liking that. It fits my style too. So this is what the NDLA is. So, so what it means is, in conclusion, I am not going to replace NDLA with NDLA 2.0. Uh, I don't think NDLA 2.0 has the qualities to replace the previous one, but uh, I am happy with it. It is a completely different beast and it does its job in a different space. So I'm going to keep the two of them around for different in trader profiles. For those of you that are like to take more risk, NDLA 2.0 is there. And for those of you that like more, a more conservative approach, uh, uh, NDLA will be there. So I'm going to, to take a look at the questions just in case there is anything here. Oh, the backlighting now? Oh, yes, I know. So let me try to lower this a little bit and see. It's just a big office and I have to come huddle in a little one here. Uh, Jim says that likes the uh, recall and negative precision. Of course, that was the whole point of uh, NDLA 2.0. Um, yeah, the recall is fantastic. Uh, it's unbeatable. But recall is not everything. I mean, for instance, look at the naive strategy. 
If you look at the naive strategy, which only has 30% success rate, which is actually very good, the naive strategy has a recall of 100%. No? <laughs> By definition, recall is 100%. So recall is not always everything. But in this case, I like the balance of recall versus full precision. Um, and I also like partial precision. It's very consistent above the board. Partial precision is fantastic. And this has inspired me, and I'm just giving away a little bit of what I'm doing, is uh, to create something. I, I am not going to call it NDLA. I'm going to start using different names because there are too many NDLAs to track. But I'm going to create a neural net that basically is the same thing, but it's only looking for two sessions instead of five. Why? Because look at this partial precision. This partial precision is fantastic. And if you do the statistical distribution of the partial precision is in between two and two and a half days. So I'm going to design a net that looks for these 1% moves in two sessions. I, I think that one will capture the partial precision. The, the whole idea is to capture this partial precision without waiting for the five days. Because what is happening is we get the heat and then the market comes down. So I'm trying to get the to capture most of the hits before the market comes down. So I think a two session strategy might work. Um, so that's something that I'm exploring today. Okay, so looking at the questions, uh, it seems that option strategies that we can use for earnings plays. And also I have a very early question about uh, strategies that additional to the ones that we're using right now. Okay, so yes, I talked to the, about these things towards the end. Let me go through the just through through the questions that were posted in the room and then I'll come back to these ones. So let's look to ambiguity. Ambiguity is, is this big mystery that I post all the time. It's like one of the most mysterious things and uh, there is a reason for that. The, the whole ambiguity concept goes back to probably 1920s, you know, when Knight um, came up with the concept of Knight and uncertainty. You know? Uh, so, so ambiguity ties in my, but the whole point, I don't want to go back so, so far back, but the whole point is that ambiguity connects with the concepts of risk and uncertainty. You know? And there has been many ways to measure risk and to measure uncertainty. In fact, the VIX, the VIX, is, is, is just one of those things. It's a, it's, a, it's a great measure of uncertainty in the market, or what we call volatility. You know? So ambiguity is another statistical concept that for many, many years, uh, it was very hard to measure. There were many competing approaches to measure it. So uh, there was a breakthrough probably in 2010, 2011 uh, in the methodology to measure ambiguity. And I'm using one of those methodologies. So uh, what I'm trying to measure here with ambiguity is I want to measure basically the variance of probabilities. That's my methodology, which is the one that is used by the main researcher that published on this area, which is also one of the creators of VIX. Um, so, so you can conceptualize it as a variance of probabilities and it, it gives you extra information. So imagine, for instance, volatility. What is volatility? Volatility is the variance of the closing prices uh, of an asset, in this case, the market. No? So it gives me some information. It, it tells me something. But the variance of the probabilities of those moves are very interesting, too, because they are giving me extra information. And what kind of extra information is giving me? It's giving me information about the attitudes of the market towards that variance. And with that, we can compute interesting things. And one of the things we use it in the room, the way I use it is, well, the NDLA uses it. It's one of the inputs to the NDLA. And B, when ambiguity is too high, uh, the market tends to fall. And not only fall, the market tends to crash what, or like have a massive correction. So uh, ambiguity, there are a couple of conditions that I monitor when ambiguity is high enough. Right now, ambiguity is still low at 0 0.24, but it is, it is getting there. It is moving. One more week like this is going to be pushing the 0 0.35, 0 0.4. Ambiguity moves between 0 and, and higher than 0. <laughs> but usually, the, the, the highest we have seen is like 1 1.5, 1 1.6. Um, for reference, it was before the main crash in 2008, in January 2018, it was uh, 1.5, I think. It was gigantic, and then we crashed. 
and, and then last year it was around the 0 0.36 area where we start having this correction. So, so we, are, we are getting there, we are getting there with ambiguity. Um, sorry about that, let's see. Let's look at the volatility, uh, volatility review. What is happening in volatility? As you can see, volatility is extremely low. The variance in the market has been extremely low for the last month, which is the 20 here, for the last two weeks and for the last week. I mean, it's incredibly low. The market uh, is incredibly low. As you can see, VIX remains on the 12s, and I have seen people complaining that VIX should be lower. And, and yet, yes, it should be lower because there is a lot of distance to fall. If the market continues like what it has been doing for the last couple of weeks, VIX is going to be around 10. I'm telling you, or below 10 pretty soon. And if, if you remember for me, back in January, I made a call for VIX at 14 that looked really uh, optimistic at that time, but it happened. Look at VIX is 12. And now I am doing for a call for VIX around 9 or just 9 point something. I think that that it is doable if we don't reverse hard right now. I know that the, all the Elliott Wave experts are expecting a move down, but um, you know it's still a mythical move down. It's, it's on the mythical realm, so not happening yet. Okay, so that's in terms of volatility. And of course, folks, you can ask questions at any time. Uh, so please, please ask questions if you have anything on your minds. I got a, quest, a very good question about volatility products. And volatility products, uh, in particular VXXB, and, and in general, big futures and leverage products. So let's go with volatility products. I, I personally, I dislike volatility products all the time because VIX cannot be traded. That's the sad part of the VIX. It's so useful. We keep an eye on it. We all obsess about the values of VIX. Yet we cannot trade it. There is no one can buy VIX or sell it. So you have to do derivatives for it. Like we have VIX futures, but the futures are not the same thing that VIX. It's, it's like in the market. No, like the ES futures are not the market. ES futures are different to the market. Um, and we also have VXXB, I put B in parentheses because the original product is VSX and B is just a legal maneuver from Barclays to uh, get rid of the past liability and create a new liability for the node. But anyway, so my thoughts about VXX, which are, for those of you that know me for a few years back, they, they, you know what I think about VIX, it's, it's a crap product, it's trash. But it's precisely because of that, it's so good. It's probably the best chart in history. The product is designed to go to zero. That's what it is. I mean, if you look at the mathematics of VXX, uh, you'll notice in the prospectus right there, you can conclude quickly that the designers of VXX designed the product to go to zero. And the thing is, the product never goes to zero because the reverse is split it. But at, from all practical purposes, the, with our, the product is going to like 0 0.001, 0 0.0002. It's like the paradox of Xenon. No? Uh, it, it is asymptotically approaching zero as time passes. So it's a fantastic chart. And in that sense, it's a great product to play short volatility. Because even if volatility doesn't go down, VXX will go down. <laughs> so it's the is the perfect chart. Playing long volatility with VXX is more tricky. I will not play it. I mean, uh, you could do it in a very short time, probably two or three weeks, but longer than that is a terrible play. It's a terrible play with options or with VXX. Don't do it. Um, it, is, it is terrible. The decay, the product has a natural tendency to decay because of the way it has been designed. And connecting with this subject, there is leverage products. I know I, I, this, this thing is, if I, someday I retire, I'll start some kind of like, I don't know, ONG about uh, leverage products. I, let's remove them from the market. They, they have no reason to exist. Any inverse ETF, any leverage ETF, by definition, is, is a defective product. It's terrible. Um, the reason is because the product resets every day. So when you, when you create an inverse ETF or when you create a leverage ETF, the only way to produce the, the, the inverse 
behavior or the leverage behavior only happens intraday, only happens between 9.30 in the morning to 4 p.m. That's the only period where you will see that. And every day it resets. And people don't realize that when you read the prospectus of these products, you don't realize that. that that well that's a technical limitation of course that's the only way you could actually create a portfolio that tries to in replicate the inverse of another or to try to replicate the double of another uh, that's kind of the easy way to do it the easy you no know, it's a hard but it's, it's, it's manageable the problem is you are on the other side of that of that pro portfolio replication and and because you're on the other side, you don't understand that you're not going to hold it for one day. I mean, what kind of retail investor buys a product at nine in the morning and sells it at four? Retailers, retail investors or traders tend to hold the product, which is completely contrarian to what the prospectus says. The product is not designed to be held for longer than one trading session. And it's just, please, you know, keep this in your brains. Uh, leverage products are only designed to be used for one trading session. That's it. So, well, what is the reason the existence of these products? Okay, so these products are designed to capture fees. That's it. It's the best way to capture fees. And also, and this is a valid use, is to circumvent the charter of uh, certain funds. You know, the certain big funds, uh, mutual funds, have charters and the charters forbid them, like they cannot do certain things. So, yeah, a good way to walk, look, <laughs> jump above, around or go through the loophole of uh, the charter is to use uh, these ETFs. So if your charter says that you can never short, well, your charter doesn't say that you cannot buy an inverse ETF, you know. So it's a good product for those guys, but it's a terrible product for anyone else. Anyone else, guys, you are wasting your money using leverage ETFs. And, and the reason is, there are many mathematical reasons. The main mathematical reason is if you do a mathematical analysis, and I always promise I'll post one mathematical analysis, is that um, a leverage ETF doesn't matter what you are holding. It doesn't matter if it's short or long or 2x or 5x. It's a short variance bet. So when, when you buy a leverage ETF, you are short variance of the product that you're buying. And that per se will not be bad, but the problem is you are short variance at a very cheap short. So it's a very cheap short variance short. And that's terrible because if there is an event that moves, that creates volatility in your product, you are going to lose money no matter what. I mean, you are almost guaranteed to lose money because you are short variance for the period that you are holding it. So if you hold a leverage ETF for two weeks, you are short variance for two weeks and only a crazy person will be short variance for two weeks. I will never be short variance. So don't get me started on the options. <laughs> so these products should not exist. And then we have options for them. I have no idea how, how these guys price the options. I don't think there is any mathematical framework to price options for leverage products. It doesn't exist. Yet, there are options. So like you, as you can imagine, the options are overpriced because, because, because we don't have a mathematical framework. The only thing we do, okay, we use this imperfect replication and we multiply by two and that's the price that I'm giving to you. So options are terrible. So the whole takeaway of this slide is, please, don't do leverage ETFs, please don't do inverse ETFs. Play the product, play something that you understand. Play the shares, play the options. These products are crap. These products are not for retail traders. And I am all for banning the products from financial markets. There have been several um, initiatives by SEC and FINRA to, to ban the products, but there is resistance because they, you know, they generate money, they generate lots of fees. Okay, and now we go to the Q&A. So let's look about all of the questions, okay. Uh, okay, so I have someone asking about the NDLA saying that um, it's back to exit when positions are, are uh, so let me see, I lost the questions, okay. So the question is, is so good, but full precision not as good. It's best to exit in positions the first time the target is his rather than weight. Well, that's a good question. With the NDLA 2.0, I have not devised a good strategy yet. I guess um, it could be, yes, taking partial profits and then riding a little bit towards the end. I guess that will be the best compromise in there and that. 
Okay, now, so going back to the, to the original questions about uh, strategies other than the NDLA. You know, it, it might be surprising to you, but in the, the Gamma Optimizer room, we used to do all sorts of different plays. Now, nowadays, it seems that we are only doing the NDLA. It's because it has been so successful, um, but now we do all sorts of plays. So, for instance, one of the, my favorite plays that I do for my own, I, I don't know if you guys know, but for instance, I make a living. I am a, a full-time trader now. This is what I do for a living. So one of the things that I do for myself is I capture variance risk premium. That's, that's the strategy that I do all of the time. The thing is, that strategy is not suitable to all of you. That's my problem. My main problem with that strategy is that uh, it is not suitable to most of my members because it requires uh, lots of capital and also because the risk reward is not as high as, as I want and also the execution is very complex. So, uh, so imagine if executing the NDLA trades that are basically vertical spreads, I, I, I don't think it gets more simple than a vertical spread. People have difficulties getting in and out. Imagine trying to capture BRP that involves uh, very complex strategies, you know, mostly some forms of exotic option replication. So I always tempt to, to bring a systematic trade to the room. And, and I always, I don't do it because I feel bad. I mean, if I bring the systematic trade, people will try it once or twice. And sometimes they'll make money. Sometimes they lose, they get tired of the trade. Uh, sometimes they lose money because they don't know how to execute it. I mean, they execute the wrong contracts or I don't know. So it's always a risk, but yes, I'll try to introduce uh, this is a question from Carla. I'm trying to introduce more neutral type of strategies, in, which are uh, strategies that try to capture the variance risk premium. The main risk of those strategies is that, as you have noticed, the market has a tendency to drift. And the drift in the SPX is always up. The market always drifts up. It seems to be a stylized fact of the market. And it is, I think it's reasonable because we are in a bull market. So during a bull market, if you don't touch the market, it will go up. No, so so that's it makes hard to do a neutral strategy uh, without hedging because the market is moving up. So you have to pair it with some kind of hedging strategy to neutralize the deltas of the move up. And I I don't know. I always have a hard time trying to 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 balance a strategy that is is complex enough to capture the BRP, but it's simple enough for you guys to execute. I, I'll I'll keep thinking about those strategies. I also saw saw questions about um, about uh, neutral trades for earnings or earnings trends in general. So, earnings earnings trades is the same thing. Remember, earnings are a casino. Uh, I don't play. I don't play earnings that much because of that. This is just a casino where you make money, you lose money. Uh, it's, those are fun, I must admit. Earning trades, earnings trades are fun, but uh, I, you have to approach them with a the mentality that is a coin toss. Um, the, sometimes the stock moves gigantically, sometimes it doesn't move, sometimes it goes up. It's impossible to predict. The edge of the earnings trade must come from someplace else. So it must come from Elliott Wave trading, for instance, like some long-term targets, or it must come, the options should be so overpriced, so overpriced that it's basically a guarantee you're going to make money. So just very few cases, very few times we get that, those kind of setups when, when options are uh, overpriced in such a way that they have like 95% probability of the stock being within the region. So I will play that. And when I play those, I create the example. So my favorite strategy for a neutral earnings place is what is called a strangle swap. And I can go in detail over it on the room, not here in the video, so I don't bore you with it. But, but strangle swaps are really good to capture that, but only if the edge is massive, massive. Uh, in general, any long straddle, long strangle play is a loser. There is, in general, option dealers are too good. They always price options um, really well. And I don't know, I think, okay, I think my, my video is having issues. I see red lights here, so if, just let me know if you are not seeing me correctly. Uh, oh, Jim, what strategy do you use to capture BP? Jim, I used, 
I used a variation of a, a strategy that I posted like three years ago to the room. Uh, so it involves butterflies that are delta H. So I use delta H, in, butterflies delta H, but it's more like an static H. I don't use dynamic hedging of the butterfly. Um, and that's what I do. It's really, is, uh, is there an easy way to identify options as overpriced? Um, okay, so yes, I, there are ways, that's, that's what I do. When I do the analysis, when you request the analysis, you notice there is a parameter called PA, the probability of the absolute move. And if the probability of the absolute move is 90% or more, then there is a good edge. Options are incredibly overpriced for the move, and there is a good edge to enter. But if the probability is 60% or 70%, um, no, it is, it is not, it is not a, a good way to do it. So, any more questions? I think we are over the limit and I think my connection speed is kind of like oh, iffy. So if you have any more questions, folks, just let me know. And uh, it, as usual, it's really good to, to have these uh, live videos from time to time. Don't, please don't let me forget about them. Don't let me, uh, yeah, don't let three months pass between these videos. Carla, a strategy, okay, this is a, a question about a strategy to exploit premium erosion. Okay, let's answer this one. So there is no such thing as pre strategies to exploit premium erosion. Uh, t t time decay is a fact of the options, it's, it's, it's part of the option pricing theory. That's why uh, there is no edge on time decay, in Carla. There, there is no way to make money just on time decay. Okay, it's, it's something that you have to, uh, all of you have to realize because it, it is not an edge. Time decay itself is not an edge. It's, it's just part of the option. The, the, the edge is in the variance risk premium. The edge, the strategy to capture variance risk premium is, is related to that, but it's, it's slightly different. And I, I guess it deserves a, a point. Um, and okay, I have a question related to that. Okay, so, so in general, yes, the selling premium is a bad strategy, but selling variance risk premium is a good strategy, and I'll, I'll expand on that on the room. Another question from Samuel is if playing negative signals, I forgot about that. So when, when you look at the NDLAs, you see the 90% uh, probabilities for a negative signal. You see that negative signals are fantastic, and should we play them? And the answer is no. The thing is, the, the, there is not enough edge on that trade, unless you get the spread. If the spread is like $3, if the call the spread for the 1%, then my, well, I might sell it if it's $3. But $2 is not a good edge. $2 is a good edge for positive signals. So anyway, I have to go, folks. I have to do other things. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. There is going to be a recording of this. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, have a great day.